Hi there, welcome to the Spirit of Wisdom and Revelation channel. So today we're going to speak about when God speaks to us. And you know God is speaking to us in various ways and He's always speaking. He's always speaking. There's a lot of people out there that say, you know, I've never heard the Lord speak to me or I don't get dreams and visions. Um, you know, I just... I just read the word, but I don't get these experiences. So I hope today will encourage you and and uh, just open your eyes and your ears actually to see how he is actually speaking to you all the time. Um, and then today as well is also for those skeptics that um, would rather hold fast to just the word. It says, you know what, I'm not one for these dreams and visions things. I think it's a bit flimsy and... Um, you know, it's open to everybody's interpretation and there's so much deception out there. I fully understand why people would think that. But you know what? Um, I also pray that this devotional teaching will, will help you to think and lay a bit more weight to dreams and visions and the various ways that God actually does speak to us. Um, the other purpose of this devotional teaching is also that, and most importantly, that we will have an understanding of how Father has determined that dreams and visions will be a very important means by which He will provide for us in the time to come. So I will be discussing that in this devotional teaching as well. So, you know, let's go to Hebrews 1, where it talks about how God has been speaking to us. Um, let's read from verse 1 to 3. God, who at sun-dry times and in divers manners, divers manners in different ways, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So it starts here by saying that God has been speaking to them in diverse manners and in sundry times before. He spoke to them through the fathers by the prophets. Okay, so it's talking about scripture, about uh, five books of Moses, and then the prophets. And it's interesting that it says, spoke to them in diverse manners through them. So not more than one way. And then it says here that is in the last days, which we are in now, we are in the last days. Since Christ has come, it's been the last days. He has spoken to us through his son. And he says that... Th by his son, who is the express image of his glory, upholds all things by his word. So the word of God and how he speaks to us is absolutely critical that we understand how he speaks to us. Because that is how you live by the spirit. Okay. So in what way did Yeshua speak to them when he was here. He spoke to them in diverse manners. Just like he spoke through the prophets in diverse manners. So one of the most important and let's say the first way that God speaks to us. And Yeshua spoke to them at the time was through the word. Whenever he spoke about scripture it would be, he would quote out of Isaiah. He would speak about Moses. Um, he spoke about Jonah. So he spoke about the fathers and the prophets. He spoke out of scripture. In the same way, God speaks to us out of scripture. We will read a word, our heart will be pierced with the sword of the spirit, and we will know God is now speaking to me, and I know this is referring directly to my own life. It can either bring repentance or conviction or direction or understanding. Okay, so he speaks the first way is through scripture. Then he speaks through dreams and visions. An example that how Yeshua did that, let's take for example, um, when John the Baptist baptized Yeshua in the Jordan, it says that he saw the Spirit come down upon him like a dove. So that is a symbolism, right? It's like a dove, it's like a vision. He saw the Spirit come down on him. 
Another example is the Mount of Transfiguration where John and Peter, I think James was there as well, and saw how Yeshua was transformed. And they saw Elijah and they saw Moses. So they saw a vision. It was an open vision on a mountain that they saw. So he spoke through that, that those means as well. Another way that he speaks is through experiences. And that's how he spoke to them. Different things would happen around him that was like a type and shadow. For instance, um, when Yeshua fed the, the thousands, the five thousands, he fed them with five loaves and two fishes. And afterwards, he said to them that man shall not live from bread alone, but from every word that comes from the mouth of God. And he said to them that he is the manna of heaven. So that experience set the table, so to speak, for him to be able to say, I am the living bread. I am the true manna that, that fed my, the fathers in the wilderness. So I am the true manna which you must feast from. It's through that experience that he could minister to them. Uh, another way was when he fasted for 40 days. It was a type and shadow, or let's say Moses was a type and shadow when he fasted 40 days of Christ that will fast for 40 days. Um, in Hebrews 3, it speaks of how Yeshua is a greater than Moses. So it's comparing them. So that experience, that fasting experience was speaking to us, is speaking to us and was speaking to everybody around him. He was speaking constantly by what was happening around him to his disciples. And in the same way, whatever happens to us, around us, to us, first has to come through the Father to get to us. And Father has a divine purpose with that when it happens. Whether it's in your body, whether it's with somebody else, whether it's something you see happening around you, or things repeating, he's speaking through these experiences to you. Okay. Then Yeshua also spoke through creation, and he did that through the different parables. If it wasn't about a seed, it was about a pole. If it wasn't about a pole, it was about sand, building a house on the sand. It was about the sparrows, about the lilies. It was about coins. It was about the wind, about fire, about gold. Everything created, he used that to bring a message across. That's why he spoke in parables, right? So he speaks to us through all things created. In fact, in Romans 1, it says that ever since creation, he has been speaking to us. And then it says it has been he has been speaking to us through creation. So since creation, he's been speaking and through creation, he has been speaking. You can read that in Romans 1. And then he speaks to us through numbers. Many people say, I see the number 11 continually. I see the number 8 or 9 or triple 4 or triple 2. Now, these numbers have great significance. Now, if you see it once, then it's just a number. When you see it over and over and over and over and over, then you need to take note. Now, in my own personal life, he has been speaking to me with numbers. I only have a few numbers that's really important to me. Um, but they either refer to a scripture. For instance, triple four for me is John 4 verse 44. Um, and triple three for me is Jeremiah 33 verse 3. So he speaks through these numbers. So they can either be a scripture they can either be a Strong's Concordance number or they can be a date. Triple uh, two is a date for me where he said something specifically to me. So he, he lays so much emphasis on numbers that he would use it when he spoke to his disciples. Um, the, the fact that he told them they have to wait for 10 days in the upper, uh, upper room. The number 10 means completion. Um, it means perfect. Um, it means fulfillment. He, he said that he will be in the grave for three days, three days and three nights. 
he the the two fishes and the five bread breads were a reference to the seven churches two of the churches mentioned in the book of revelations are evangelists so they are the two fishes the other five are the loaves of bread so we are fisher of men so that's why they are the two churches of Smyrna and the church of Philadelphia. They are the two fishes. So even that experience with the numbers, with the miracles, with what he said, is everything that he speaks and spoke to them about, but also that he speaks to us. So I'm going to mention those examples again through, word, through the word, through his spirit speaking to us, um, through dreams and visions, through experiences, through creation, and through numbers. There could be more that I'm not mentioning here, but that is how he spoke to them, and that is how he still speaks to us. Okay, so we need to understand that, um, especially for those who are a bit skeptical about this and just careful because, you know, they've heard so many dreams and visions and people going haywire, you know, you, you get those who are more conservative and they prefer only to stick to the word, they feel safer with that. Then you get those that are so dream and vision or, orientated that they've got no substance to them, no foundation with regards to scripture. We need both. They are both there to minister to one another. So um, there are the, I know there's some apologists that say that God, has, there's no longer anymore something like a prophet, somebody in the office of a prophet. God now only speaks through his word. I absolutely disagree with that statement simply because the office of prophet is within the fivefold ministry. So if you have to take away the prophet, you also need to take the apostle, the teacher, pastor and the evangelist. If you want to take one away, then you have to take all of them away. And it's a hand. So uh, uh, the body, right, needs the hand in order to do anything. And the body of Christ needs the fivefold ministry as a shepherding function to look after the body. You cannot eat without your hands. You cannot brush your hair without your hands. You cannot dress without your hands. You cannot write without your hands. You need your hands to do, uh, to do anything. So the body has the hands to minister to it. Right? And to be subject to the hands. And to pray for it. So in the fivefold ministry, we have the uh, apostle, the prophet, the teacher, the evangelist, and the pastor. They all shepherds in there, but they shepherd the body in a different way. But the two that I want to focus on is the teacher and the prophet. The teacher, God speaks to the teacher by opening up the word of God and revealing the word through the word, by scripture with scripture, bringing greater understanding and mysteries are opened up because of that. So the mystery of the letter is revealed by the spirit with, that guides the teacher. Go to this scripture, go to that scripture, and it opens it up. Whereas the prophet, how God speaks to the prophet, is through dreams and visions. By speaking, giving a specific word to the prophet to speak, right? But also to use the prophet's life itself as a message. For instance, like Hosea that had to marry an adulterous woman. Like Jeremiah, whose wife died and he wasn't allowed to cry to show that God will not mourn or cry over Israel's demise um, or like Jeremiah who had to lay on his side so he uses the prophet himself so different uh, um, preparation goes into preparing a teacher than they would in preparing a prophet that doesn't mean a teacher cannot prophesy and it doesn't mean a prophet cannot teach. It means how they were prepared will determine their office. Okay. And the specific call on their life. But they need each other. Now, how do they need each other? Everything about them has to be based on scripture. So the teacher is the one that will come to the prophet and say, 
I am not sure whether this aligns with the word of God. You need to check yourself whether you are still uh, uh, um, meeting up with the plumb line of the word of God. And that is a provision to protect the prophet. Whereas the prophet is there to come to the teacher and to say, let's not put God in a box and say that he will not use certain things. For instance, a good example would be, we know the law says there's certain unclean animals, like a raven is considered an unclean animal. Yet God told Elijah, a prophet, that he has commanded the ravens to feed him. So if Moses, for instance, we had to tell Elijah, Moses, uh, Elijah, you can't use a raven. Elijah can tell Moses, no, but God said he commanded the ravens. You understand what I'm saying? So the one is the letter, the one is the spirit. The letter brings death, but the spirit brings life. And together they minister to the body. That is why there is such a thing still as a prophet. Okay. But we need to understand there's a difference between the gift of prophecy and the office of prophecy. Paul said to the Corinthians, I desire that you will all prophesy. When what that means, prophesy is to exhort and minister. He's referring to the gift. He's not referring to the office. The office is completely different. Okay. So another, you know, good way to explain how Father uses dreams and visions. Just before I started this uh, devotional teaching, I had a dream. And in this dream, I was looking from the outside into a car, but I couldn't see clearly into the car. I saw somebody in the car, couldn't make out who it is. And the car was light blue and it had uh, 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 misty windows. And I saw a finger writing the word Chloe on it. Now, if I'm standing on the other side, the word Chloe is supposed to be the other way around, reversed. But I could actually see it the right way around. So I saw the word Chloe. And what the meaning is, the interpretation of that small little dream, was the car represents ministry. Because a car is ministry. You're moving forward and you carry people in the car and you give direction and we go in a certain direction. The blue speaks about revelation. It's uh, The color blue has got to do with uh, revelation, like the, the heavens are blue. So bring revelation, understanding. Now, why Chloe? Why the window? The window has got to do with eyes. The, the window of a car is the eyes of the car, if I can say it that way. It's the, the ability to see, to bring revelation. And why Chloe? Because he was referring to the house of Chloe. Now, the house of Chloe I spoke about in my previous devotional teaching where I said I was looking for my little dog, Chloe, that was dirty and all that. And I referred to 1 Corinthians 1, talking about the house of Chloe where there was division. So Father wanted to, me, to understand I need to go to that scripture to speak to you about what I need to uh, reveal to you of what he's shown me about dreams and visions. Okay, and their purpose. So that's just... A simple way of how he gave direction and the purpose behind it. So let's go to 1 Corinthians 1. The first thing we're going to hear of is um, where Paul says that he is now coming to, to the Corinth, uh, Corinthians and he heard something from the house of Chloe. Verse 11. For it has been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe. So the people in the house of Chloe were obviously giving a message to Paul that he needs to come over to Corinth. And he says that there are contentions among you. Now this I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul and I am of Apollos and I of Cephas and I of Christ. So they were upholding to different people and Paul is going, uh-uh, no, 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 no. We're not going to say, I'm of this person, I follow this person, I, follow, I don't listen to any of the other people, I'm this person. He's saying no. He goes further on to say that he has determined among himself to know nothing and to only preach the cross and Christ, 
Christ crucified. So he's drawing their attention back to Christ and saying not to look to man. Okay. Um, let's go to verse 23 to 29. We preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. Now in this case with the Jews being a stumbling block, what they are preaching is because the Jews, the word says, that um, the Jews prefer a sign. Um, they came to Yeshua and said, show us a sign that you are a Messiah. And he told them it's a wicked generation that wants to see signs and wonders because you don't believe by faith, right? So they did not believe on him. They did not have the faith. So Paul is saying, if I preach Christ crucified, it's a stumbling block unto the Jews because they cannot receive it. And then he says, unto the Greeks it's foolishness. Now the Greeks were known for their wisdom, Greek philosophy, humanism, psychology. All these kind of things comes from the Greeks. So they represent man's wisdom and the Jews represent man's unbelief. Okay. Then verse 24, but unto them which are called, that would be us, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God. So Christ crucified, pre uh, preached to us, is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For us who understand, for us who are walking by faith and not trusting in man's wisdom, preaching Christ, we receive that as the power of God and the wisdom of God. Verse 25. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men, after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, are called. Those who think they've got it in the bag, they know scripture so well. Those who, um, like the Jews, held on to the letter, and the Greeks onto their wisdom. Those who... They don't want to go with all these wishy spiritual stuff that people want to believe in. Okay. Those are foolishness to them. He says those are not called. Those are want to hold on to these things. Okay. Verse 27. But God have chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God have chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Think of Yeshua. How he spoke about... Uh, the, the different parables um, through different creations and created things and, and various means. He spoke and they considered this foolishness. He used a weak man. Um, God used a weak man, Yeshua, from Nazareth. Nazareth was considered the lowest of low places in Jerusalem. That's why Nathaniel said, can anything good come from Nazareth? He uses the weak things. He uses a babe born in Bethlehem. Okay. Verse 28. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught the things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. Okay. So let's go <clears throat> to 1 Corinthians, sorry, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 4 to 7. Paul is here talking about how he's preaching and he's saying, And my speech, my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. He says, I wasn't trying to convince you about how much I know. Because if somebody could convince them with enticing words, probably Paul, because of how he knew scripture. He was under the greatest, greatest teacher or rabbi at that time. And he himself was a very great Pharisee. But he says, I'm not coming with enticing words in man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and of power. Okay, He's saying, I'm, it's by the spirit that conviction comes, not enticing words. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men. In other words, so that you shouldn't look to me but in the power of God. Albeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. Wow, who would that be? Who would be the perfect? 
Why would it be considered wisdom to those who are perfect? That perfect means, um, it's referring to the scripture where God says that his eyes goes to and fro seeking those who are perfect, whose heart is perfect towards him. In other words, they seek him alone and his will and they have no guile in their spirit. Okay, their hearts are perfect towards him. They have the right disposition towards him. And when he speaks, it's considered the wisdom of God. Albeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. He's saying this, what, what we speak is a mystery. It's hidden things even before the world were created. And it is for our glory to be able to understand. Uh, Proverbs 25 verse 1 says it is the honor of God, to con it's the glory of God to conceal a matter. And let me look it up instead of me trying to remember it now. <laughs> Okay, verse 2, it is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. Okay, so let's read that again. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. So all these ways that he is speaking to us is a mystery. It's not just scripture, but scripture is the foundation of it. Okay, let's go to verse 9. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God have prepared for them that love him. The things that God have prepared for us for the time yet to come, and what we shall see and hear, we have no idea. He's saying, whatever is written in scripture here, you have not read it even yet. It is not even being documented. What I have prepared for those that I will use in the time to come. For those whose hearts are perfect towards me. For those workers. You have not seen yet what I have prepared for you. Okay. Verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. So this Paul is saying, I come to you in the demonstration of power and of the Spirit. And the Spirit reveals the deep things of God, the hidden things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God. God's Spirit in us. That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. He's saying the wisdom that is of God is a mystery. And it's the Spirit that reveals it to us. And He has given us the Spirit so that we may know the hidden, deep things of God. Okay. Verse 13, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. He's saying, people that are unwilling to be taught by the Spirit, in how he is showing them through everything, the mysteries and the deep hidden things of God, they are considered to walk not by the Spirit, but by the natural. They're scared. They're scared of deception. They're scared they're going the wrong direction. 
but God has set us free in his liberty and to trust him that he will that he says his sheep knows his voice and another they will not follow so if you know scripture and you know his voice you will know his ways Verse 15, but he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. Why is he judged of no man? Because his heart is perfect towards God. He's walking by the Spirit. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he might instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Okay, so we need to understand the difference between Paul and Apollos. Interesting thing about Paul, um, Paul I can consider as a man of the spirit. You know, if you just think of the revelations he received, um, even talking about the thorn in his flesh, because of the, the abundance of revelations that Paul received. Um, whereas Apollos, Apollos was actually well known for um, his understanding in scripture. It says that he was actually eloquent in his understanding of scripture. And the word says that he was mighty in scripture so he was a teacher and he was fervent in the spirit he was a man of zeal apollos um, so that makes me understand where the word uh, apologist or apologetic comes from from the word apollos because he had an understanding of scripture so here you have paul that is a type and shadow of the the prophetic and you have apollos that is a type and shadow of the teacher and how they are meant to work together um, interesting part when you read Romans 16 you read about uh, Priscilla and Aquila that came to Apollos and Apollos at that time still uh, uh, baptized in the name of John the Baptist and then the, the word says that uh, um, Priscilla and Aquila came and spoke and opened up the scriptures to him now the name Aquila means eagle and the moment you hear eagle, you think of the prophetic ministry because an eagle has 20-20 vision and it flies in another dimension. So it has a prophetic uh, a connotation to it. Now, to use another example of this is when you consider that Priscilla and Aquila is linked to the church of Smyrna, right? Now, John the Baptist, um, Yeshua said, that he was uh, <clears throat> as Elijah it was Elijah he was a prophet and um, the the the, the uh, uh, John the Baptist died through beheading and the church of Smyrna which is the Priscilla's and Aquila's right Romans 16 says that they laid their neck on the line they are a type and shadow of the John the Baptist group they are the eagles. That's why I said the church is an apostolic and a prophetic entity. So they come to Apollos as a prophetic entity and they open up scripture to him. And he could run with it. So the teacher and the prophet is there together. Okay. To minister to the body. One hand. Right. One hand, the prophet, the apostle prophet, the uh, teacher, evangelist, and pastor. To minister to the body, no body can go without a hand. It needs the hand to wash the body. Okay. So, um, in John 4, 24, we read what Yeshua tells the woman at the well. He says to her, the time is here that those, my father is seeking those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. That's both the truth of the word of God and the spirit to walk in conjunction. That's why we cannot throw away dreams and visions in various ways that father speaks to us through his spirit in diverse manners, the mysteries and the hidden things of God that the world will not receive. Okay, so how are we to discern this? How can we correctly discern this? In Matthew 5 verse 8, Yeshua said, The pure in heart 
shall see God. The pure in heart. Now, the word says that we are to guard our heart with all diligence because out of it flows the issues of life. Right? Everything that happens to you, you perceive through your heart. Whatever is in your heart, the manifestation comes out of your mouth. Whatever is in your heart it determines how you see. Whatever is in your heart determines how you hear. If you still got past issues and you're still wounded and still need to dealt with, you cannot handle criticism, you take it personally. Um, if you still hold on to certain traditions, um, hold still on to certain on the law and things that is burdensome, you discern through that and will become judgmental. When you have bitterness or anger in your heart, you will become critical. So all these experiences and dispositions, even your disposition towards dreams and visions and these various ways that God speaks to people, right? That is a filter through which you live your life. And yet Yeshua tells us, those who are pure in heart shall see God. So your ability to see accurately is determined by the condition of your heart. It's determined by whether you have guile in your heart. It's determined whether your heart is pure or not, whether you have dealt with all those filters. And a good example I can say of my own life is there was a time when I um, had dreams. Not I didn't have visions yet, but I had dreams. And I was involved in something that had deception in it, and I still had emotional baggage. And Father took me out of that and I asked him to remove all dreams from me. That I didn't want to receive any dreams because I knew I could not trust my dreams. I could not, one dream I could clearly understand what it mean. Another one I understood it through the filter that was undealt with and I got it wrong. So therefore how could I discern what was really right and what was wrong? And so I asked him to take it away until I have dealt with my heart and went through the necessary seasons. And about two and a half years after that, the Spirit guided me again to ask for dreams. And then He started giving me dreams and visions, and it's ever since just multiplied. So the point I want to make is that I myself had to deal with my own falters in order to purify my heart by the Spirit so that I may see clearly. And hear better. So everything in our Christian walk is determined by the condition of our heart. Specifically our seeing and hearing. Okay. So in Matthew 6. Let's go to Matthew 6. Where it talks about. Where Yeshua talked about um, seeing the eye. And that's in verse 22. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. Okay, a single eye is a reference to dove's eyes. A dove can only see one thing at a time. It doesn't have peripheral vision, so that's why it cocks its head to, to see something. It's got a single eye. So he's saying, if you are wholly devoted to me, you have no lovers, everything belongs to me. You have a single eye. Then your whole body will be full of light. Verse 23. But if then I be evil, thy whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? So if you're evil eye, it means that you have a divided eye. Like a snake. Like a lizard. It's got a split. It's an evil eye. It's... It's got many lovers, so to speak. It's got, it's divided within itself. And it says that if your eye is evil, then you become dark within. You are unable to see because you walk in darkness. Not because it's around you dark, but it's in you dark. And you, uh, 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 John says in 1 John, he says that those who walk in the light will not stumble in darkness. 
Those who have a single eye, whole body will be full of light. They will not stumble in darkness. You see? Now, the interesting part about light, the, the light scientists have found out has the whole color spectrum within it except black. Right? Because there can be no darkness in light. Because darkness cannot comprehend light. It cannot overpower it. The moment you put a match on in a dark room, the whole room is full of light. Okay. So light has all the color spectrum in it. And many years ago, I was, uh, let's say, seven years ago or so, Lord told me, now you see in monotone, but you will see in color. And at that time, I didn't know what he meant by that, but I, I understand it now. And what he, right after that, started to bring across me is videos, um, across my path, is videos where people receive, that were colorblind, in other words, they see in monotone, were colorblind and receive colorblind glasses that in, help them to see in color. So he was saying, Petra, I'm going to give you glasses in the spirit to be able to see and perceive things in color. Now you know in general what's happening. But when I give you the ability to see because of the purity of your heart and the things that you've dealt with, you will start to see clearly in light because there will be more light in you to perceive the hidden things and meanings all around you. Your whole life will be full of color. And that is the case. He speaks to me constantly. Constantly. It is overwhelming. Constantly, I am able to receive him speaking to me through things that through everything that I've just mentioned to you right at the beginning. Not because Peter is like the bee's knees, but because I've allowed him, his spirit, to deal with those things in my heart in order that there can be more light so that I may see in color. So when we say, I see it in the same light as you, that means I also see in the same colors as you. And you know, Think of the fact that scientists have proven that with conception, the moment when a sperm cell goes and becomes one with an egg cell, scientists have proven that at that moment, there is a flash of light in the body, in the womb, right? A flash of light and it speaks of the, 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 uh, 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 the spirit of life. Or, or life that just entered into that egg. And think of um, the word Yeshua that says he is the light of the world. And Eli uh, uh, Elijah, John the Baptist, who is as Elijah, says that he is not the light. So he's also a, a light, speaking of the light. And who is the light? He is the word of God. And what did God or Yeshua say the first thing when he created something in Genesis. Let there be light. It says the whole world was full of darkness. And then he said let there be light. So when you were born again you were in darkness. But it says that those who were in darkness will say that they saw the light. And so the moment you were born again, there was light, there was life. The word became flesh in you. So the word of God is light. It's spirit. These things are all mysteries combined together. Okay, but that is determined. Your ability to see is determined by the purity of your heart. And the things that you have dealt with. Um, let's go to Matthew 13. And this is something that I asked the Lord before. I mean, the, the way this devotional teaching started was because I asked him, why is he using dreams and visions in the devotional teachings? Why not just give scripture? I mean, it's more than enough. 
And that's how this all unfolded. And in a way, I was asked, because he reminded me of the scripture where the disciples asked him, why do you speak in parables? A dream and a vision is like a parable. It's a mystery. It's something you need to figure out. So I asked him why. So let's go to Matthew 13. And we're going to read from verse 10. Now remember Paul spoke that, or said that we spoke, he speaks in mysteries. The wisdom of God is the mysteries and the hidden things of God. Chapter 13, verse 10. And the disciples came, or verse 9, who have ears to hear, let him hear. In other words, they have ears. Everybody's born with ears. But let's see if they will hear, right? If you, will, if you have the ability to hear, you will hear. So that means there are people who do not have the ability to hear, depending on their heart. There are people who have eyes, but they do not have the ability to see, depending on their heart, the darkness in their heart. The filters in their heart still need to be dealt with. Verse 10, And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Just like Paul said. But to them it is not given. So he's speaking to them in parables about all these general things around them, right? And he tells the disciples, you know the mysteries. You know what I'm talking about when I speak about this. But these people, they have no idea. They can't receive it. They are the Jews and the Greeks. It's a stumbling block to them and it's foolishness to them. Okay. But not to you. It's mysteries that you understand. The kingdom of heaven. Verse 12. For whosoever hath to him shall be given and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away even that he hath. This is a grave warning. It's saying to us, listen, I give you different means by which I speak to you the mysteries of God. If you will take note, if you will lay weight to what I'm showing you, if you will understand how important it is, then I will give you more. If you will search out the hidden and deep meanings of it, I will give you even more. But if you think this is frivolous, and as you lay no weight to it, and you do not want me to speak to you, or you do not consider, even consider that I use these things, then even that which you have will be taken away from you. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing not, seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand. And by seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. Why? Condition of the heart. That is written in Romans 1, where it says that he's been speaking to him through creation, but they cannot perceive it because their hearts waxed dark. It grew dark. Okay. Verse 15, for this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand through the ways that I'm speaking to them, but they don't want to, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes. For they see, and your ears, for they hear. You understand the mysteries of God because you've been given the mind of Christ. And the degree that you understand it is to the degree that you understand the word of God and the light within your heart, which is determined by the purity of your heart. Verse 17, For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. He's saying the prophets that foretold of all these things that would happen, they desired to see these things, but you are now seeing it. Now we need to understand this scripture also in the is to come within the tribulation. We need to understand 
that he is going to show and speak to us through these various means that Paul referred to as eye has not seen and ear has not heard the things that God has prepared for those who love him. He's saying to us, you have no idea the things that I will show you in the time to come, not just the things that will happen on earth, but the things in the spirit realm that I will reveal and open to you. Because of you that have no guile in your heart and because of the purity of your heart, you will see the things of God, the deep and hidden things of God. That veil will be lifted because the time that you will go in, there will never before in the, since the creation have been such a time. You were born for such a time as this to be able to receive the hidden mysteries and things of the spirit that they will not see because I will use you as my prophets as a prophetic entity the church will go forth and be light will bring color to this monotone world in which the world is in bondage to they see their monotone world as color but it's gray and lifeless but you will bring light into their darkness and you I will use through signs and wonders dreams and visions just as I told through my servant Peter saying and referring to Joel 2 that these signs will come in the last days signs and wonders your young men will prophesy and your sons and daughters will dream or old men will dream dreams and your sons and daughters will see visions he has determined that in these last days he will use dreams and visions because it's going to require dreams and visions to help us. It will be a provision for us. So, I mean, have you ever asked yourself why out of all things did the Lord God decide that he's going to use dreams and visions at the, in the last days during the tribulation. It is because the time that we are going to go in is going to be seeped in unreality. And only that which is of the spirit is reality. AI will be taking over. It will take over those who have been given over to the mark of the beast. It will take over the whole system. It will take over the whole world. And People will be seeped in unreality. If it's not something synthetic and cloned, it will be nothing that you read you can trust, nothing that you see you can trust. With everything, the blue beam projects and everything that they are able to manipulate and jerk this world with, the unreality, we who are of the light will see clearly because God will speak to us in our spirits and through all these circumstances and dreams and visions and he will direct us we are going to need to be guided by the spirit because this world will be in the clutches of that which is unreal while we need to be in reality which is the spirit we need to walk by the spirit let's go to um Yeah, in Luke 21, 26, let's just quickly read that scripture. We, the disciples asked Yeshua you know, about the end times, what will it be like? And, um, and he told them, amongst many things, he told them that various things will happen upon this earth that will be quite frightening. So that's Luke 21, verse 26. He says, men's hearts failing them for fear. And for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. You can only imagine what it will be like. The darkness and the thick sense of fear that will be prevalent on this earth. When the tribulation is taking place. World war, hunger, um, famine, um, murder, pestilence and plagues. 
natural disasters, the sun darkening, um, meteors, the earth shaking, earthquakes, in extremity, this darkness, fear that will absolutely be like a dark blanket over this earth. And here we are, and we need to be strong. And he is going to provide for us in such a way that can only be done by walking in the Spirit. Okay, so what are dreams and visions for? Now, the Lord has shown me eight things that I can mention. Maybe there's more, but these are the eight things that he has spoken to me about. The first thing is direction. Um, for instance, uh, 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 Paul, when he wanted to go to Jerusalem, I think it's in either Acts 15 or 16, he wanted to go to Jerusalem and he received a vision that he must go to Macedonia. And there he met a lady, a seller uh, of purple, and her name was Lydia, and, it, and she was converted and her family. And it said that through Lydia, the doors of the gospel were opened to the whole of Europe, just for one person. But Paul did not ignore that vision. Another example is Ananias that was also through a vision that received a message that he needs to go a man that has been blind, Paul. And um, he must tell him of the things that he will suffer for the gospel's sake. He was directed through a vision. So dreams and visions are there for direction. Um, warnings, that's the second one. Dreams and visions are there for warnings. Think Now, as I mention all of this, remember he's giving us this as a provision for the time to come. Warnings. Um, Polycarp was the head bishop of the Church of Smyrna, of which Priscilla and Aquila is a type and shadow. And he was a disciple of John the Revelator. And just before he died, the Lord gave him a dream where his pillow was on fire and he knew that he would burn at the stake. And the next morning, the centurions came to capture him and they brought him and tied him to the stake and the fire didn't want to burn him at all. And he died by, uh, they killed him with daggers or knives. But the Lord warned him that this is how he would die. Okay, that is the example. Um, another warning, for instance, would be Pharaoh that had the dreams of the famine with the, the wheat and with the... Uh, uh, um, uh, with the cows, the thin cows and the fat cows. That was a warning of a coming famine. Then another uh, way that the Lord uses dreams and visions is by giving us understanding. Um, think of Peter who sat on the roof and he saw the white linen uh, 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 cloth reaching up to him and all different kinds of unclean animals on it. And the Lord told him that he must eat it and he said, not so, Lord, I will not eat any unclean thing upon my lips. And the Lord was explaining to him that the gospel is now opened up to the Gentiles because the Gentiles were seen as unclean. But now, through this vision, Peter received understanding that he needs to open the gospel to these people. I think of if the Lord God gives you a vision that you think, I will never go and speak to that person, but the Lord gives you understanding that that person will receive it. Okay. It gives you understanding of the meaning of scripture. Then as confirmation, I can use my own example here. Um, a few, about a month or so ago, I became aware that I can't do my own transcripts of my devotional teachings. They're just taking way too long. And I asked Father that if it's his will, I'm not sure, but if it's his will, that he will send me somebody that will be able to do my transcripts and that he must give that person a dream. He must answer them in a dream. I was very specific. And I think it was a week after that, one of my friends, Stacy, phoned me and said she had a dream that she was doing my transcripts for me. And I never told anybody about it. So that was an excellent confirmation through that uh, 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 request. He confirmed it through a dream unto another. Then another way he's going to use dreams and visions is to serve the body. Somebody will come to me and say, Petra, I have this kind of dream, but I do not know the interpretation of it. I think of Joseph. Joseph told Pharaoh, the interpretation is of God. 
in the same way, we need to understand that the body within itself, they minister to one another with the gifts. Think of the dream that Maya had in my previous devotional. In her dream, she was on like a conveyor belt that could see into a church that was a building that was a demented children's home that represented a broken down church. And she saw the toys hanging from the ceiling and toys are gifts. And it's hanging on the ceiling because it comes from above. And the word says that every good and perfect gifts come from above, from the Father of lights. Right? And these toys were hanging on the ceiling because the church weren't utilizing it. They weren't playing with their toys. Right? The gifts weren't being utilized within the church and that's why it was broken down and demented. So the gifts are there to serve the body, to minister to one another. Okay. That includes dreams and visions. Then um, to make a way. Um, Proverbs 18 verse 16 says that. Let's read that rather. Proverbs 18. Proverbs 18 verse 16. A man's gift maketh room for him and bringeth him before great men. So it, it makes room for you. It, it means it, it's, you get a, to make room. If I say make room, it means give me space. It means it gives you a greater platform to minister to people. And it brings you before great men. That means great men of authority. We have an example of Joseph who interpreted the dreams of the baker and the cupbearer. The cupbearer left before Joseph and Pharaoh had a dream. And the cupbearer remembered, but there's this man that was in jail or in prison or in the dungeon that interpreted my dream. Maybe he will be able to interpret Pharaoh's dream. And so what happened with Joseph? Joseph came before Pharaoh and he, was, he received room. And he came before a great man. Pharaoh was seen as a god. And so what happened is because of his gift of interpretation, he was able not only just to become second in command, but he was able to feed his father and the tribes, his 12, brother, or, yeah, his 12 brothers. That's because of that gift. So it will make a way. So we don't know in the time to come how a, the ability to dream something about somebody or the interpretation of it, of a dream will be able to bring us before those who are in authority who do have dreams and visions and are fearful of it and know there is a meaning behind it and because we are able to interpret it or help them right God will make a way for us he will give us favor he will help us it could even save lives then it opens a door for the gospel. Say I have a dream about somebody that is unsaved. And I go to them and I warn them about this dream. And this dream comes true. That person will know that it was God that had compassion on men. And wanted to save them. It opens the door for the gospel. And then the last one is revelation. If you think of Daniel. And you think of John the Revelator. Both received information through visions and dreams and in Daniel with interpretation of dreams as well. It's because of those revelations that we now have an understanding of the end times. So people that want to throw away dreams and visions might as well just tear out the book of Daniel and the book of Revelations and say, you know what, I don't need those flimsy things. They, I can't touch them. They're not real. No. This bears great weight. And so he will even give us revelation in the time to come through these dreams and visions. So you can understand the weight and the purpose behind dreams and visions and the various means that he speaks to us for the time to come because we are desperately going to need it. That's why he said, man shall not live from bread alone, which represents scripture, manna, but from every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Every word, every way that he speaks to us. We live by the Spirit. We walk by the Spirit. Okay. Now, a while back, 
Um, I had a vision, uh, probably about three years ago, I had a vision where I was, um, I was, I was busy praying and I saw a Bible open in this vision. And the next moment I saw an oak tree growing out of this Bible, a massive oak tree growing up high, 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 high. I could barely see the top of it. And then I saw the branches branching out and the birds coming to sit in the branches. And what Father was saying to me is that out of Scripture, He is causing me to grow as an oak tree and that there will be others to sit in my branches. Okay. And then if you look at Matthew 13, which I wasn't even thinking of at the time when He showed me this vision, I can clearly see the vision in it. Let's go to Matthew 13. Matthew 13, verse 31 and 32. Now this is another parable. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs, and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. So you can see now how this is surely, uh, uh, um, how the vision that he has shown me is a type and shadow of verse 31 and 32. Now the word of God is an incorruptible seed. And I first saw a Bible, the word, the word. And out of it came this tree. So he says the word, the, the kingdom of God is this little seed. That is so small, it's like a mustard seed, right? And that it grows like a tree and the birds come and sit in it. So why did he choose a mustard seed? I decided I'm going to look up the meaning of mustard seed. So the, the name mustard seed means to hurt or sting. So this mustard seed is not a reference to faith. Because Yeshua said if you had Faith like a mustard seed, you can cast this mountain into the sea, right? Or tell it to move into the sea. But this mustard seed is a reference to the word of God. And it stings and it hurts because a sword stings. And it says here that when it is sown in the field, that word sown means to draw a sword. So it's a clear reference to the word of God that is a seed that grows as a tree. And that growing as a tree, the word grow, means to wax or increase. That's what that tree did, which I saw. It increased, increased with strength and stature. Now, a few weeks ago, I woke up with the words, you must wax strong in the spirit. This is what Yeshua told me. I must wax strong in the spirit. And there's a reason why he told me this. The reason why he told me this is twofold. First of all, because of the things that will come upon this earth and what we will see. The second thing is what he will show us when he lifts the veil and we will perceive that things, those things that are hidden that is in the spirit realm. You know, John the Revelator, when Yeshua appeared before him, fell down as a dead man. His body, him himself, could not handle the things of the spirit world. The same with Isaiah. He said, I saw the Lord in Isaiah 6. I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And then he said, woe is me for I am a man. Point number one. I'm just a man with unclean lips saying, I know what's in my heart. So there's a clear understanding when God starts to show you things of the spirit world, your physical body cannot handle it. And this is what I have been speaking to him about in my private conversations with him. I've been saying to him, enlarge my heart, Lord. I cannot contain what you show me, not because he's showing me this mighty revelations, but it's the abundance of revelations. And it's um, aware of the veil between 
the spirit world in my life becoming thinner and thinner and thinner. And it's overwhelming me. Because I know I've got to do with the living God. It overwhelms me to know that he's speaking to me all the time. Sometimes I feel like I just want to jump ship and swim for the nearest shore. But he knows he's got me hook, line and sinker. He knows it. But it is a fearful thing to stand before him. It's a fearful thing to know the living God speaks to you and you are accountable for what comes out of these clay lips. Okay, Paul says, I come before you trembling in fear. I often do that before I make a video. I tremble. And there's no confidence. I have no confidence in the flesh. None. And so we need to wax strong in our spirit. And that word waxing strong in spirit um, is written in Luke 1 and Luke 2. In Luke 1, John the Baptist was told that as a boy, as a little child, he waxed strong in spirit. In Luke 2 verse 40, it says that Yeshua as a boy waxed strong in spirit. Now that wax is 2G2901 and it means to increase, to grow mighty and strong, right? And spirit, the word spirit is the word pneuma and it means, let me see, oh, I wrote it down, a vital principle by which the body is animated, which makes me think of that conception when the light comes. The spirit of man is that light in you. Okay, so his spirit waxed strong. How did it wax strong? It says from a very young age he would go into the temple and he would spend time amongst the rabbis and he would learn of them. He would learn of them. He was in the word. Remember that incorruptible seed that grows as a mighty tree. It waxes strong. And so um, recently Father has drawn my attention to Psalm 1. And he wanted me to memorize Psalm 1. And if you don't memorize scripture, I want to ask you what are you going to do when Bibles are not allowed? Whether the digital or the actual Bible. You need to memorize scripture, even if it's just one line, one verse. Okay, so he took me to Psalm 1. Just verse 2 and 3. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season, his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Okay? So blessed is the man. Blessed is the man who meditates on the law day and night. His delight is in the word of God, because he will be like a tree, like my vision, like the mustard seed. He will have leaves that are always green. doesn't matter what the season is, he will bring the fruit. We... Because we drink from the water of the word of God, right? Becomes oak of righteousness, right? Oaks of righteousness that are established in the word of God. And the fruit that we bear, others eat of. We becomes, become trees of life that others can eat from. We become trees of light that others can see. Because we are established, we grow and wax strong in the spirit, in the word of God. And this is what we will need in the time to come. You see, dreams and visions are not the end. They are a means to an end. But this word is the beginning and the end. And we will only wax strong as much as we are established in the word of God and walk by the Spirit. Uh, Ephesians 3 says, I pray, Paul prays for them and says, I pray that he will strengthen your inner man with might by his Spirit. So it's both the Word, the, the letter, both the Word and the Spirit that causes us to work strong. This is what this whole devo devotional teaching is about. It's about the Word and the Spirit, the teacher and the prophet. 
They go together and this will be our provision for the time to come. The interesting part when I uh, was memorizing Psalm 1, it was just before my birthday. And on my birthday, my mother-in-law gave me this. Uh, I hope you can see it. It's a tree of life. One of the ways he just spoke to me. We are trees of life. We are trees of life. We bear fruit for others to eat from. As much as we are established in the word of God. And the, the condition of our fruit is determined by the condition of our heart. And the thing that Father said to me as I was reading about all of this. He said to me, the source determines the substance. What your heart is full of, the light, the word, because your word is a light unto my path and a light unto my feet, a light unto my feet, my feet and a light, a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Right? Uh, um, Psalm 119. But it's in your heart where that word is planted as a seed. And that purity of your heart, having dealt with your issues and being established in the word, which clarifies and lightens your heart, will determine your ability to see, will determine your fruit that you bear, that others will eat. Okay. Um, I want us to go to John 1. Now, John 1 is about Nathaniel, and Nathaniel is a type and shadow of the workers, the first 144,000 that will be here during the seals period. There will be 144,000 in um, during the trumpets period. But the first example of them is Nathaniel. Okay, let's go to verse 51. Now, the reason why I refer to Nathaniel as that is because Nathaniel is also seen as the man without guile. The same example is given to the 144,000 of Revelation 14, where the virgins are without guile. Okay, now Nathaniel here is from the tribe of Issachar, and his name means gift of God. So we're talking about the gifts of the Spirit here. Right? So it's sort of the, the gift of God is the Spirit. Nathaniel is a man after the Spirit. He's a representation of the Spirit working through man. The gift of God. And he's from the tribe of Issachar. In my devotional teaching to Johns and a Jezebel, I explain how the Johns are a reference to Issachar. That is the blessing that's spoken over the tribe of Issachar is that they will be as a donkey among in the meadows that bears the burden, which means they shepherd the, they they are as shepherds among the, the flock, Issachar, and it's a Levitical priesthood dating back to Aaron, which refers directly to John the Baptist. Those are of the light. You see the reference to to the first group, the prophetic group. Okay. So let's read what it says here from verse 51 in John 1. Not 51, sorry. Um, 46. And Nathanael said unto, or let's 45. Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. What do we know about Joseph? Joseph was a dreamer, and Joseph um, had a multicolor uh, coat. A multicolor coat is a reference to the three Gospels. And Yeshua, when you go in the Strong's Concordance, or uh, during the crucifixion in Luke, it says that that robe, when you go in the Strong's Concordance, is a glorious, glorious white robe. In the Scrolls Concordance, the crucifixion, the robe in Mark is a purple robe. And in Matthew, when you go into the Strong's Concordance for the robe during the crucifixion, it is a scarlet robe. So here, the son of Joseph in his robes, the Gospels, 
the one, the dreamer, the man of the spirit, is meeting Nathaniel, who is a representation of those who will be sent out. Jesus saw Nathaniel, no, verse 46, and Nathaniel said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip saith unto him, Come and see. And Jesus saw Nathaniel coming to him and said of him, Behold an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. Nathaniel said, and in other words, his heart is perfect towards him. Nathaniel saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before that Philip called thee, you, in other words, I saw you before Philip. Philip is the second hundred and forty-four thousand. When thou was under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and saith unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Jesus said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou sayest, shall see greater things than these. He's saying, I'm going to show you greater things. What is he going to show them? And he saith unto me, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Year after ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Now think of this. Nathaniel, pure in heart, there's no guile, is able to see. Which one of us, who of us would, when somebody comes to you and say, listen, I saw you under the peach tree. Um, which one, uh, who of us would say to this person, oh, wow, you're the son of God, you, the king of Israel, on the base basis of the fact that you saw them under a tree. Nobody. But Nathaniel was able to see the hidden things, the mystery of God. Because of the purity of his heart, there was no guile. And because of that, God is saying, for those who are pure in heart, I will show great and mighty things. I will show you the heavens open up. That is what they will see. And that's why our spirit needs to wax strong in the word and by the spirit. So that we will be able to bear and endure the things that will come upon the earth and that which we will see in the spirit realm. Um, probably about four years ago or so, um, the Lord showed me, uh, um, uh, I had a, a dream where I saw the hordes of hell. And it was a terrible experience to see that. To wake up from that for hours, I was traumatized still by that. To see the grotesque figures and what they look like. And how huge they are and how murderous and barbarous. I mean, that's evil. You could experience the evil. To be able to see that, it has an effect on you. Um, also, one of my intercessors said to me that she was praying for me and she had a vision where I walked out onto, out of my house and I overlooked mountains and she said the heavens opened up and I could see chariots. And she said she looked at me and it was the most normal thing for me to see. She said it was like the most ordinary, everyday thing for me to see something like that. That has not happened yet. But I know that I will see these things. If we are unable to bear that which is physical through which he speaks to us, when it's so, so much, too much for us to handle that we, our bodies can't handle it, how will we handle it when the literal heavens open us and we will see what happens in other dimensions? How will we be able to handle that? If we see that continually, unless we wax strong in spirit. So this message is much to me as the two, more to me than anybody else, obviously, because I'm teaching it. You know, think of Moses. If he had to walk past the burning bush and say, that's just another bush. It was the norm for them to see bushes burning in the desert. That was nothing new. But he turned around because the bush didn't burn out. That's why it caught his attention. But what would have happened if Moses just saw another bush and went past? How many burning bushes have God put on your path that you have ignored because you were not willing to turn around and look? You were not willing to stop 
at here. You were not willing to receive the various ways that he wants to speak to you. Because you do not lay weight to these things. How are we going to desperately need dreams and visions and the various ways that he wants to speak to us? I know I'm going to need it. I pray that you will, through this, more than anything, dive deep into scripture so that the Spirit can draw out the water of the Word and wash you with it, cleanse you, and so that more light will come into you so that you will be able to see because of the purity of heart. That you will be able to perceive the hidden mysteries of God and understand that for those who have, more will be given. And for those who have, even that who don't believe, even that which they have will be taken away from them. Desire these things. Pursue him for this. Whatever his will is, whatever he wants to use you for. He knows what you need. But don't dismiss it. Don't think it's for others and not for you. When you are actually going to need it more than ever. He has made a way by his spirit. May the Lord bless you and keep you as you consider these things prayerfully before him. Amen.